All right, good evening, everyone. I wanted to thank everybody for joining United Spinal Association Greater Philadelphia Chapters monthly educational webinar. We are very excited to have Judy Morrison here with us this evening to talk about the Pennsylvania Center for Adapted Sports. Judy Morrison is a physical therapist as well as a volunteer with PCAS since 1993. She has been the program manager for PCAS since 2019. She is also a world rowing international classifier and teaches skiing to people with disabilities in the Poconos. She lives in Nazareth, Pennsylvania with her husband and dog and enjoys anything outdoors, but especially hiking, cycling, camping, and sailing. During our webinar this evening, if you have any questions, please utilize the chat feature and I can provide them to Judy as she's going. Or at the end of the webinar, if you'd prefer for me to unmute you, you can have more of an open dialogue with Judy regarding any questions that you might have. Also at the end of the webinar, please view the chat box to find links for our YouTube channel where you can view this and all of our other webinars, as well as a link to our membership page if you are not a member and would like to be of the Greater Philadelphia Chapter. And I would now like to welcome and introduce Judy Morrison. Hi. Hi, everybody. I see Nat is here. Nat's one of our skiers, so I recognize one name already. But uh, thank you for having me. We're, you know, very happy to have to meet all of you. This is, this is very exciting. Should I get started? Okay. You're all good. Share my screen here. Hopefully it's going to work. Um, if you don't see my screen changing, please let me know. <clears throat> um, the last time I did this, there were some issues, so hopefully everything's good now. But I, as uh, Megan said, I'm with the Pennsylvania Center for Adapted Sports. And the screen's not changing. So, oh, now it did. Okay, so the Pennsylvania Center for Adapted Sports was founded in 1995. We combined the Philadelphia Rowing Program for the Disabled. It's now called PAR, which is Philadelphia Adapted Rowing. That was founded in 1981. And the Adapted Ski Program at Jack Frost was founded in 1982. In 1999, we moved over to Camelback Ski Resort, and that's where we've been since. So um, PCAS was founded, it combined those two programs and then developed much more, um, pro many more programs to, through, to help get people with disabilities involved in sports and recreation. So we have 13 sports. They are birding, climbing, cycling. They have, we have a place in Philadelphia and a place in Chester County. Indoor rowing, kayaking, rowing, outdoors sitting volleyball, skiing, yoga, virtual fitness, virtual movie club, and triathlon. Triathlon's kind of a pseudo sport for us. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's not a formal sport. And then we also have five sports specifically just for youth athletes. Uh, they include rowing, ski camp, skiing, swimming, and track and field. So I'll touch on those. I don't know if anybody here is a youth under the age of um, 20 but those could be for you. If you're not, then you're gonna go for the uh, regular sports for all ages. So our mission within PCAS is that we work to expand access to healthy lifestyles for people with disabilities by developing inclusive sports, recreation and wellness communities that value all abilities. So our goal is to get, if you have a disability, our goal is to get you outside or inside um, in sports, in recreation activities, and uh, being included with other people with disabilities as well as other people without disabilities. Uh, what is an adapted sport? So a lot of people kind of ask, what is an adapted sport? What is an adaptive sport? Are they the same? Are they different? They're basically the same. Some people may also hear the term para sport. That's more related to um, higher level and in, uh, competition, international competition. Um, but adapted means that we adapt the sport to meet the needs of the individual participant. We don't adapt the participant to meet the needs of the sport. Um, we use different equipment, additional strapping, et cetera, things like that. 
So the picture on the bottom left here is a girl um, sitting in what's called a throwing chair for track and field. And the youth use um, safer javelins than what some of the high school teams use, but she's using a um, javelin sitting in a throwing chair that's giving her a little bit of support so that she doesn't have to, she's not able to stand. And then the picture on the right is a three step transfer bench. Um, so this is how we can help a lot of our athletes get into rowing shells, kayaks, and even some of our lower, lower to the ground bicycles or hand cycles. So rather than having to go from your wheelchair all the way down to the ground in one big fell swoop, this is nice, it's a little step down. Um, so we've got a lot of equipment like this that we can offer to use and help people um, <clears throat> get out of their wheelchairs and into other equipment. So who are we? Uh, Pennsylvania Center for Adapted Sports reaches approximately 500 plus people with disabilities per year. Our age range currently is four to 94. We did have a 94 year old man um, ski once with us. So that was kind of fun. 95% um, of our participants do have a permanent physical or visual impairment. And then we have about 5% of our participants with a permanent cognitive or intellectual impairment. Those um, athletes tend to come to our ski program. Our ski program is offered for people with, with all impairment levels. Um, types, and then all of our other programs are geared towards people with physical or visual impairments. Uh, we do have over 500 volunteers within all of our programs, and we've had 11 um, athletes come through our program that have become Paralympians. So if you're not familiar with the Paralympics, it is the Olympics for people with physical or visual impairments. It's run after the regular Olympics, always in the same venue, the same location. It's two, two to three weeks after. So once the Olympics is over, they close the venues, reset everything, get it all ready, get everything cleaned up, make sure everything's fully accessible. And then um, the Paralympic athletes and volunteers and staff all start coming in and they have the Paralympics. And what's neat um, about the Paralympics is a lot of people don't realize this, that the the teams, the countries that medal in the Paralympics, those medals go towards the final Olympic medal count for your country. So um, it's kind of cool that we've had in our Pennsylvania Center for Adapted Sports based in Philly, 11 Paralympians go through our program. Uh, most recently, we've had two um, skiers, one of whom took three medals in Sochi in um, skiing, in downhill skiing. So I'm just going to talk about each of our programs. And again, if anybody has any questions, um, please stick, put them in the chat or after I'm done, feel free to talk, ask any questions you might have. Um, birding isn't truly like an active sport, but it is an activity and recreation activity that we want to get people out. So we find accessible trails throughout Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Delaware. Some of our um, Outings are actually driving outings. So uh, over the winter in January, February, we do a couple of driving outings down in Delaware and the Jersey Shore. And that way you can get out and see the birds that are there in the winter. Um, all of our uh, outings are approximately two hours long. We do various locations throughout the Philadelphia region. Again, New Jersey, Delaware, we've come up to Lake Nockamixon um, near Quakertown we find accessible trails. And then um, you do need to sign up for all of our programs ahead of time. And there's forms that need to be completed, waivers that need to be completed. And that comes through me and I'll share that, info, that email address later. Um, but yeah, so you sign up and then we find accessible trails. If there is a trail that's not fully accessible, we have some volunteers that come along with us and will help uh, help you through those less accessible trails if need be. You can also bring friends or family members to help you. Um, we have the woman who leads this is an avid birder and she somehow, I'm amazed, I did one of our outings and somehow we saw and or heard over 30 varieties of birds. And she writes them all down and she sends them out to you afterwards. And it's really cool to see it and then get you to figure out what you can see in your backyard or, you know, down at your local park. And it's really, really fun. Um, 
So it's a great way to get outside and enjoy the outdoors if you're not super active. And it's a good way to start getting involved in our programs. It's very low key, less low stress. Uh, climbing is the next program I'm gonna talk about. And that meets two days a week, I'm sorry, two days a month. Um, we meet the second Wednesday of the month at the Gravity Vault in Radnor and the fourth Wednesday of the month at the Cliffs in Hel Callow Hill. Um, both of these programs last two to two and a half hours. Again, you have to sign up ahead of time. We have volunteers who will belay and assist as needed. So belay are the people, um, if you look at this bottom right picture, there's a, a guy in a red helmet. He's holding on to the orange rope and then there's somebody else holding on to the orange rope. Those are, they're doing what's called belaying and they're making sure that the climbers don't fall. Um, the person in the far right picture is using, I forget what it's called, but this is for somebody, she has a spinal cord injury. She's not able to use her legs at all. This um, handle that she's holding on to, she holds up and then she pulls herself up this way and then it resets and then she can climb up by using her hands. So this is one way to climb if you're not able to use your, your legs at all. The middle picture is another person who has a spinal cord injury and he's not using that. He's actually climbing using the handholds, but they have special pads on his knees to protect his knees and his legs so that they don't get scraped up on the, on the rocks. Uh, typically once a year, we do try to get to do an outdoor climb, but most of the time our climbs are indoors. So the far left picture, you see somebody in a wheelchair, they're helping her get her harness set up helping her get her lines hooked up. And then they will actually climb next to her and help her if she needs any physical assistance. Otherwise, they will just provide the safety from the belay. And then they will also help lower you down at the end of your climb. Um, most people will get around two to three climbs in per session um, in that two, two to two and a half hour session, depending on how many um, climbers we have each night. And then cycling, like I said, we have two different cycling programs. The first one is in Chester County. They meet on Sunday afternoons from April through October in Exton Park in Chester County. And they ride along the Chester Valley Trail. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. It's a nice paved trail that um, meanders through the Chester Valley. It's mostly flat. It's a rail trail. Um, really pretty, really nice. Get lots of people um, riding on their own. You can use our bikes, you can bring your own. Volunteers will ride with you to assist you as needed, You know, especially if you have a flat tire or something like that. Uh, there is a cost for this program, it's $60 for the season. And um, all of our programs, we do encourage people to come with family members if you have family members who like to ride and we will help you get into our equipment and then your friend, family, spouse, Children can go along and ride with you. One of our um, our executive director likes to talk about a story where they had uh, a family said they had a, a husband who wanted to ride and can he come out and ride on his own? And we said he can, but we would prefer that the family come and join him if you want to. So the, the wife had her bike. Then there were two little kids. One little boy was riding circles around his dad. The other little boy was just so excited to be out with his dad on his bike. So um, it was re it's really cool to see and we get families together doing sports or friends together doing sports. Or if you don't ride with your family or friend, come out and you'll make, make new friends and maybe new family members, who knows. Um, and then our Philadelphia cycling program runs Saturday mornings, April through October. We meet on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. What's nice here is the road is closed on weekends. So we have access, we can get cars down just for our program. Otherwise the whole road is closed. So we are able to take up the whole the whole road with, with without worrying, worrying about cars. Um, you can do the, the length of that road or you can cross over to Kelly Drive and do a complete loop, which becomes eight to 12 miles. And you can do as much or as little as you want to. Again, use our bikes, bring your own. Volunteers will ride with you as, as needed. Um, and I just, this picture here, the person on the far left is on a tandem. So there's a, an able-bodied person steering. And then there's usually a person with a visual impairment in the back. 
The middle picture is somebody with a hand cycle. It's a different kind of tandem that they made for, um, especially for adaptive. So they're on a tandem. The person in the front is using it as a hand cycle and the person in the back is on um, a standard two wheel um, leg bike. So they're connected and each of, they can each ride together. And then the person on the far right is using a hand cycle. Um, so she's able to not use her legs and she's riding with her, just with her arms. We have another volunteer in the back who's just riding along, making sure everybody's doing okay. Nobody has any problems. And then our indoor rowing program, we meet at St. Joe's University Boathouse from January through March. It's usually two evenings a week, depending on how many athletes we have. You can come once or twice if we have the space. And then we row on ergometers, which is a, a, an indoor rowing machine. And we adapt these to meet the needs of the athletes. So if you look at the picture, the person on the far right um, doesn't have any adaptations at all. The person in the blue shirt has a, uh, looks like he's got double amputations on his, his legs, but he's still able to use a sliding seat. And then the person closest to the picture photographer has a spinal cord injury and he's using a fixed seat that has a backrest and straps. So the straps will support him and not allow him to fall forward. Um, and we can use as many straps as we need to or as few straps as we need to. Uh, with all of our programs, a lot of our volunteers are sports. They've sports people, they're rowers. They've said, oh, I'm a rower. I'd love to help out. Uh, we also have a lot of volunteers who are physical therapists, occupational therapists, nurses, doctors, um, and they come because they've got the, the sports background or because they've got the medical background. So uh, usually one of our PTs or OTs will do a quick little assessment to with the new athletes when they come along, and we will figure out what might be the best setup for you, and then we'll help you get into that setup and try it, and then we can kind of modify it as need be moving forward. So depending on how successful you are, we wanna make it as successful as possible. So we can always try different things. Again, with the bikes, we've got a two shipping containers full of bicycles. So we're able to mix and match and try different things and different straps and all kinds of stuff to, to make you have a success, help you have a su successful experience. Um, our kayak program meets at different various locations. We have been on hold as our volunteer program director has stepped down and retired, but we are hoping to start back up on the Schuylkill River soon, and then we will be expanding again as we're able to. Um, we've done a lot of uh, paddles in South Jersey, in the Pine Barrens, through the Pine Barrens, in the little streams and rivers there. We've done the Schuylkill, we've done Lake Nakamixon, um, lots of other places. So lakes that we can go to. Um, Lake Nakamixon, if you have your own kayak, does have an adaptive kayak ramp. So that's kind of cool where it's a fully accessible ramp to get in and out of your kayak if you're not with a program or with people who are able to help you. Our rowing program meets uh, Tuesday and Wednesday evening from 5.30 to dusk, May through October. Our boathouse is actually on Martin Luther King Drive. It's not on Boathouse Row, but um, we ask everybody to choose one evening and then come consistently on that evening. Uh, we're, we don't have a whole lot of flexibility to switch nights week to week. And then when you come on one night, you also get to learn know the volunteers and the volunteers get to know you. So it makes it a lot easier to get your equipment set up and get you out on the water. Um, we always st we start out with an ergometer. So we do what we call parking lot rowing. Um, and this is last year. We had uh, a big group of rowers um, would come each night and they would be out in the parking lot and they would get coached and we would do some training. And again, all various different people. We've got people with... Um, the closest one here in the green shirt is where using a high back fixed seat with a strap. The next person um, is using a sliding seat. The next person has a fixed seat, but there's no backrest. So he's he's able to move his trunk forward and backwards without um, risk of falling, but he's not able to bend his knees like, like an able-bodied athlete would. 
So we modify these um, as needed. And then this picture on the right is one of our more experienced um, para rowers who uh, competed in our national event. And he's using a fixed seat with a back, some straps. In the boat, we also have what are called pontoons. So on the side of, of the boats, there's one on each side, there's a, a float that will help prevent you from capsizing. Uh, when you do progress from the ergometer to the boat, we don't go into singles right away. We usually go have our athletes go into a double with an experienced able-bodied rower first. So the able-bodied rower is able to do the steering and, and help with some of the speed control and, and the technique and the balance as you're learning to row. And then once you get to be more experienced, they can kind of wean away from you and then you can be able the adaptive athlete would then start to steer the boat and still have the able-bodied athlete there just in case. And then eventually you'll be in a boat if you're interested in a boat by yourself. You never have to go into a single boat, but if you're interested, we encourage it. Um, we also have a very large uh, all disabled regatta. It's the only all disabled regatta in the US and it's in its 44th year this year. I think it's 44th year. It might be it's 34th. I'm getting mixed up now, um, but it's in August and anybody who's involved in our rowing program is welcome to go. And it's a free event and you compete against other people with disabilities from all over the US. We have had teams from Germany and Australia come. So it's really cool to see a lot of different people um, coming out to check out the programs. And um, this is $60 to do for the season. <clears throat> so most of our programs are extremely cheap uh, or free of charge at all, free, completely free of charge. And the reason is, you know, we know living with a disability in the US can be very expensive. Um, just paying to, you know, have your car, have your wheelchair, have your adaptive equipment in your house. We want to make sports as accessible as possible. So um, a hand cycle could cost three to $7,000. We're not going to charge you for all of that kind of stuff. But when you come for our program, the nominal fee of $60 does a little bit for upkeep and maintenance. And it's also a way to help get people to commit. So, you know, you put a little bit of money into it and it's 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 a way to to help you commit to, to attending more consistently. All right. We have a sitting volleyball program that we partner with um, Philadelphia Volleyball. This is usually in the fall and we meet once a week in the evenings at Lloyd Hall, which is down behind the art museum. Uh, the picture on the left is two women with amputations. The picture on the right is some of our group who have participated. We have volunteers and athletes. So they use the same size volleyball court as able-bodied volleyball, but the, they move the net down. And the rule is that your butt buttocks need to be in contact with the floor at all times. So they do, um, our program is very laid back, but the, the uh, Paralympic volleyball, there are classifications, so sport classifications that you would get put into. And then the team has to have a certain, meet a certain level of um, impairment to, to be on the court at the same time. Um, but we mix it up and have able-bodied athletes and athletes with disabilities on the same at the court on the same time. Our ski program is uh, our kind of a different program, the rest of them. Most of our, all, all of our other programs, you can come on a regular basis. You don't really, we, you sign up the first time and then you usually just come. Uh, skiing is a little bit different where we offer private lessons at Camelback on the weekends, January through mid-March. They are $60 per lesson, and that includes the lesson lift ticket and rentals. Uh, so it is a much more costly sport, but the 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 money there is actually going to Camelback. It does, we're, we don't charge anything for our program. It's Camelback is charging. Um, the two types of sit-down skis are bi skis and mono skis. Um, Nat can probably talk a little bit about the bi ski. He's one of our bi skiers. I would have put a picture of him in if I knew he was going to be here. Um, but the picture on the bottom left is a bi-ski. 
It's hard to see, but on the bottom of the ski, there are two skis underneath. And then there's the bucket where the skier sits. They can hold on to what are called outriggers. They look like forearm crutches with ski tips on the ends. All of our bi skiers are tethered. So the tether is that red strap that, um, that I'm holding onto and attached to. And then the instructor skis behind. So the bi ski is for people with um, quad or tetraplegia or CP that affects all four limbs or muscular dystrophy or um, higher levels uh, paraplegia, kind of like T4 and higher. Um, it gives us, it gives you more stability. It, it's a little bit easier. It's, it's, um, it's an easier ski to learn. The other ski on the right-hand side here is called a mono ski. This ski is an independent ski. So we actually have two instructors with our program who are mono skiers. They have spinal cord injuries and they teach their better skiers than I am. One of them is, um, he he's part of the Pro Professional Ski Instructors of America and he teaches the instructors how to teach and he's a mono skier. So it's really cool. Um, and this girl is on a, the, the mono ski has one ski underneath and then she's using outriggers as well. So they, the outriggers act as ski poles and we do not tether the mono skiers. So mono skiers are independent skiers. We teach them how to become, uh, how to be able to ski on their own. And the goal of this girl here is she wants to ski with her dad and her sister and her mom. Um, her mom and her sister are off skiing on their own, but hopefully in the next year or so, she will be skiing with her dad and the rest of her family. And that's the goal. We want to see people get out there with their families and ski. Before I get to this, I just see there's a few chats. Um, okay. So this video is a really cool video. I'm hoping the link's going to work. This is not one of our skiers, but this person um, is an amazing skier. He skis out West and he was a snowboarder before his injury. And he was snowboarding out in Vail and missed a jump and landed wrong and had a spinal cord injury. And after the spinal cord injury, he went back to skiing and he's now a professional mono skier. He is the first ever mono skier to land a backflip. And he is now, now that other people are doing that, he's now the first mono skier to land a double backflip. So this is just, he's crazy. And I just think it's really cool. Um, so let's see if I can get this link to work. There will probably be, Filing a simple be an ad for free with TurboTax. Feels pretty good. See if you qualify at TurboTax.com. My name is Trevor Kennison, and if no one knew what my story was, um, I was a plumber, and I loved snowboarding, and I broke my back and suffered a spinal cord snowboarding, and now I am a professional set skier. My name is Josh Berman. I am a filmmaker. I started a company called Level One 25 years ago almost, and I've spent the bulk of my career working in snow sports and action sports and outdoor filmmaking. My buddy was like, come on, get up, man. And, you know, I couldn't get up. And then he's like, come on, get up, man. And I looked at him and I was like, I can't move. Craig Hospital gave me all the tools to learn how to transfer into my wheelchair, learn how to drive my own car, learn how to get into um, an airplane. They taught me just to live life on my own. I knew that you could ski, but I respected the fact that, you know, I was like, all right, cool. That's just something I didn't want to do at the time. I was playing, playing basketball. Absolutely loved it. I would drive four hours, three hours down here to go play basketball. But once I got back on the, uh, the snow, yeah, I fell back in love with it. And my whole thing was going back to Vail Pass. I wrote all these goals, going back to Vail Pass to, you know, pull back flip.
ever came to me with this amazing idea to return to the site of his accident at the Vail Pass Colorado backcountry and do a backflip in his sit ski. And I was immediately taken not only by, by the story, by the concept of, of returning to a place that has, you know, taken so much away from you, Trevor's charisma, Trevor's smile, Trevor's personality, Trevor's you know, zest for life um, immediately captivated me. And just to go back to that spot, I don't know, it was just for accepting my injury and um, just having closure with that spot. And I'm not, I'm not mad at that spot. I'm very thankful that spot happened. I'm very thankful my injury happened because I wouldn't be where I am today. Do this, boys. This one was definitely the most extreme. And so I just took everything I was doing up to that point. And that day, just everything lined up perfect. I was scared. But at the same time, it was just something I really, really wanted to do from like deep down and bottom of my heart. <laughs> So Barry Corbett was shooting a ski film outside of Aspen, Colorado in May of 1968, shooting out of a helicopter. Pilot was having a tough time seeing the undulations of the terrain. Came in too low, misjudged his altitude, and crashed. Barry ended up being ejected from the helicopter, barely survived some massive internal injuries where he was told that he would never walk again. And that happened 50 years before Trevor shows up in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and airs into Barry's namesake couloir, the Corbett's couloir, and um, landed in the public consciousness. So thankful to be on this journey and to have a purpose in life to give hope back to people. Yeah, it's crazy. We all have struggles. We all have really bad things that happen to us on a regular basis, whether turning tragedy into opportunity is just such a compelling thing. And, and Trevor illustrates that in all the best ways. There, everyone has so many physical, mental challenges able-bodied or not so when they leave that theater i want them just to be able to smile and have some hope um, for my story and they can shed some light on just if they're going through a tough time and turn it negative into a positive that's what i hope happens Trevor's got much more in his repertoire the film is called full circle it's making the rounds of the film festival Okay, so I just think that's really cool. Um, it really goes to show what is um, what's out there and what you can do. And it, I just think it's you know how how amazing that that that's just so cool to see. So, all right, um, <clears throat> back to the Pika stuff. We have um, yoga. Usually this is virtual. Well, since 2020, since COVID, we have been doing virtual yoga in the fall um, via Zoom. So we're hoping to return to live yoga as well uh, now that things are kind of settling down with COVID. But our yoga program can be done standing, seated in a wheelchair, seated on a regular chair, seated on the floor, lying down, whatever works for you and Mamie is our yoga instructor and you, there's a picture here you can see a few people um in the upper top part of the picture where she's um she's demoing and then they're mat they're matching so some are standing some are sitting some are sitting in a chair some are on the floor you do whatever works for you and then when we go hopefully move back to live yoga we have volunteers who will help put you in, help you get into different positions to stretch various parts of your body, various muscles, various joints, and then um, modify individual, make the yoga individualized for you um, that way as well. So I have kind of a picture of both. 
Uh, we might may end up end up end up doing some kind of a hybrid yoga where we'll start virtually, and then as people are feeling more comfortable, we might try to do some um, back live as well. And this is usually at Lloyd Hall in behind the Art Museum in Philadelphia. Virtual seated fitness. Uh, this is a great program. Uh, our that started started due to COVID um, and has really grown and we now have people from as far away as California doing our virtual seated fitness class and we meet Thursday afternoons from 5 to 6 p.m via zoom and it's a strength and conditioning workout that works on balance endurance strength flexibility uh, the picture on the bottom left is our lead instructor her name is Laura and she is fantastic and the picture on the right just shows some of the some of the participants doing some of the exercises. So she plays music, she keeps it, keeps it fun. She's very high energy. And I've helped on occasion. I've tried to, to cover for her when she's been out and I can't do it nearly as much justice as she does because she's just fantastic. So if you're interested in getting involved from the comfort of your own home and you're available on Thursday afternoons, this is a great way to start getting involved in the, the sports programs um, and feeling a little bit more comfortable and safe, safe because you're home and you're not having to be outside in a different environment that you're not necessarily comfortable with. We also do a virtual movie club that meets once a month on Thursday evenings via Zoom. Um, so you watch a movie on your own, kind of kind of like a book club. You watch the movie by yourself, and then you discuss it together in a group on Zoom. People will bring have snacks and drinks and things like that, and they just talk about the movie. So each month they'll decide which movie they're going to talk about the next month. And again, this is something that came up because of COVID. Uh, you know, adaptive sports are great because we can adapt and we can figure out ways to continue to make things work. And this is something that people have wanted to continue with, and we will continue it as long as people are interested. Um, triathlon is not currently a formal program, but if you are interested in triathlon, we can help get you a volunteer who can either uh, run or ride next to you if need be, or guide you through the race. We can provide equipment if you're part of our programs as well. So the middle picture on the top here is, shows two people in the water. They're going to be swimming together. And then this is uh, on the bottom left, we have a hand cyclist. And then in the middle on the bottom, we have somebody who was a wheelchair racer. And then on the bottom right, one of our kids who is stand up and, and um, ambulatory, but he did the, this, tri this particular triathlon. Um, so it's just fun um, triathlon. If you're not familiar, it's swim, run, swim, bike, run. So the, the bike can be a hand cycle or a pedal cycle. It can also be a recumbent bike. And then the run can be um, run, walk, or using a wheelchair racer. And then our youth programs. So these are specifically for youth. We have a ski camp, which is really cool. Uh, we, um, they meet, they go up Monday through Friday and they stay at a hotel close to the mountain and they learn to ski primarily. They're skiing two and, two and a half hours in the morning, two and a half hours in the afternoon. They have homework time in the evenings. They share a room with, with other kids with physical or visual impairments. And what's really cool is some of these kids have never been away from their parents or their family for one night, and now they're away for four nights. And they learn how to manage their ADLs better. They learn how to get themselves prepared, ready in the morning and get their bag ready. And they're responsible for all of their gear. And it's a great way for them to kind of not be coddled as much as sometimes parents tend to coddle kids who have impairments. Um, this is not for people who would need a bi ski, but people who can be mono skiers, it is for them. So the goal is all of these uh, kids would be eligible to go to the Paralympics. They don't have to go to the Paralympics, but they are eligible to do so. And on this right picture here, the guy in the red, the red helmet is 
our coach and he's actually one of our Paralympic skiers. So he's gone to the Paralympics three times for skiing and he comes back every year and he coaches our program. I was one of his first instructors. I'm nowhere near as good as him now. I love it that he's bypassed me by far. So that's cool. Um, and then we also have a track and field team and a swim team. And on the far left, this the woman is, um, she's training for the Paralympics. So she's hoping to become a Paralympic athlete. And she comes and helps coach um, when she has time, some of the younger kids. So we've got, um, you saw in the very, one of the first slides, there was a girl in a throwing chair. So she's sitting in a chair. This is a racing chair, so he can do the track events. And then we also have the swim team. The youth track and field and swim programs require that uh, you need to be able, you need to have an eligible impairment for the Paralympics. So you need to be eligible to go to the Paralympics. Again, not saying that you would, but that's the requirement for that program. <clears throat> Um, in the future, we are uh, planning, we are going to be having a mountain bike program. Right now, we're trying to get the mountain bikes. We had a grant, we had everything ordered, and after COVID, these supply chain issues, we haven't been able to get any, but we plan to meet on trails in the Philadelphia area. We've done, um, once a year, we do a learn to mountain bike day, just a demo day out at Blue Marsh Lake, which is kind of near Reading, Pennsylvania. And they, with I Am Able, we, we uh, meet up with I Am Able and some of their volunteers and some of our volunteers, and they provide the bikes for that demo day. Uh, the hand cycles for the mountain bikes, all of the hand cycles for mountain bikes have our e-bikes, uh, just with the, the hills, trying to do it all with your hands, you'd probably never get up it. Um, so they're all e-bikes and that's really cool. And the picture on the right is a standard upright e-bike where he's got two wheels in the front, one wheel in the back that you can't really see. His right hand is on his brake. He's uh, waving at the camera, peace sign at the camera, but the handlebars um, are in front of him. The picture on the bottom left is more of a downhill type of a bike. So you're kneeling and you're you're pedaling with your hands. You can steer with your hands if you put your hands on a special um, bar that you can't really see in the picture. But the primary way of steering this bike is using your chest. So you're leaning on a pad on your chest and when you lean, you steer the bike. So this um, to me is kind of crazy. Like you're head first down a mountain, down a mountain. Um, these guys will go down like Blue Mountain, um, downhill mountain biking. So it's, yeah, it's it's really cool. The Cinco de Mayo, I kind of put this in here. It's, it's our biggest fundraiser for the Pennsylvania Center for Adapted Sports and our biggest event of the year. It's a bike ride and walk. And it, it's um, it's how we sponsor, it's how we pay for the majority of our programs. So we get a lot of sponsorships. The event is on May 7th um, in the morning at nine o'clock. And it, there's a 50 mile road ride, a 25 mile road ride. And then there's also a any distance you want up to 20 miles on the Chester Valley Rail, rail Trail. And um, we have people from able-bodied, disabled, you name it, everybody comes out. Um, you don't have to be part of our program to take part in this pro in this event. If you want to use our equipment, you do need to be part of our program. Um, but it's a fundraiser. And this picture, I love this picture. Um, it's a picture from our ride. And I love it because it just shows people with hand cycles, people with trikes, people with bikes, people, all types of ability levels, all out together doing this one big ride. Um, so we get you out there. That's one of the things we say. We get you out there. And that's that's our goal. Um, and then this picture is, again, I like this picture. This was going to a cycling event in Philadelphia. And there's, there's a guy in a hand cycle. There's a guy in a recumbent bike. There's a guy on a, um, a two-wheel recumbent bike, somebody on a three-wheel recumbent bike, somebody on a regular mountain bike. So 
all types of ability levels all together and we all try to get out and have fun and get healthy lifestyles and make new friends. So that is the end of my um, formal presentation. I think what I'll do at this point is stop sharing my screen and then we can open it up and see if anybody has any questions or comments.